So that's what I was just saying. One hour break and uh, five minute breaks also uh, between the, the two parts. And uh, I think we, we won't open the camera to, to introduce everyone. Uh, we are quite a lot, but uh, I will start by myself. So I'm Sebastian, um, I'm from France, from north of France in Lille. Uh, I'm a backend developer. I have uh, 15 years of Java behind me and five years now with, with Go. Uh, I started Go by some customer. I'm working for, uh, for a cons consultant company. And uh, we started Go for some co customers five years ago. And uh, after 10, 10 years of Java, I really get, get in love with that, that language. And I started uh, talking about it, and uh, also some some labs like we will uh, experiment today. So I'm very I'm very happy to share about uh, about Go with you. Um, we will do we will go for a quick introduction to Go. Ole did already a, a good job. I will uh, I will maybe uh, add some, uh, some 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 points, and then we will start uh, really with the with the language. And uh, just before to, to get ready, we will be, just be sure everyone has a, an environment ready and working so you can uh, follow uh, properly the, the labs. OK, so why Go? Uh, the purpose of Go, um, Go, Go was, was built by Google in 2009. And the idea behind Go uh, was to take uh, the best parts of several languages and to, to build something that is easy uh, to, to write, easy to read, uh, robust and efficient for, for, for newcomers to the, to the, to the language. Uh, the, the, the Go team was working on, on Go, was working on the, the V8 JavaScript language, and they spent a lot of time compiling complexity of the code and so on. So um, they really wanted to have something really uh, simple, and that's how Go was built. Um, Go is quite general. Uh, you you find it uh, for web application in the cloud area. Um, more and more also for IoT. You have some specific Go distribution for uh, for IoT. Uh, people are, are trying to to work also with data and machine learning. It's really for me a perfect fit for the cloud. Um, I'm a Google Cloud certified, and we work a lot with uh, with Google Cloud. And uh, for me, it's really uh, a first-class citizen language for 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 the cloud uh, because we have lightweight uh, services. You can deploy uh, very quickly, and um, they they have very small uh, memory footprints and so on. So this makes really go a perfect fit for cloud application and cloud native applications. Uh, you find Go a lot on uh, CLI application. Uh, now you can uh, also build some HMIs, um, mobile app. Um, a few years ago now, uh, we have um, they, they, they added the WebAssembly support for, for Go. So you really can find Go uh, a lot of place, and it's a good fit uh, for to, to be able to, to build some, some toolings in different areas. Uh, like always mentioned it, uh, OK, it was born by Google. But or he, for from now, uh, it's already used by big companies. Uh, Docker, of course, is built with Go, Kubernetes, uh, Dropbox, Spotify. Um, if you're working also a bit in the cloud area, uh, Hashic HashiCorp with its Vault and uh, Terraform and all of those products are built also with Go. So a lot of big companies uh, have found the benefits of using Go. Um, and in the north of France, we are mainly working for retail. So Java is still 80% uh, of, the, of the market, uh, of the, the development. Uh, but more and more uh, companies now go to go to, go to 
try some web services we, we go and for for the the low print and the, the ability to to also to migrate quickly from java to go for for the people uh this is a, a really good fit for for at company level so uh it was built in two it was born in 2009 uh, at google what, what what one point that is really important also is that um Go is born after multi-core CPU were born. And a lot of languages had to adapt themselves uh, to be able to, to, to take advantage of multi-core CPU. Go was built after that. So by, uh, by design, Go supports multi-core and supports it very efficiently. So it's an uh, open source language. Uh, you can contribute to, to, to Go, uh, even if uh, mainly Googlers are, are working on it. But uh, it has also a good, uh, good support in the open source, um, open source field. Um, it has self-contained binaries. So you can, from, a, from a, a PC, a Mac, or so on, you can build a, a Go binary and just copy it uh, to another machine from with the same architecture architecture and it will work uh, you don't have to 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 have a, a runtime you don't have to 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 use some uh, libraries and so on so this is quite interesting uh, and works pretty well with docker uh, we'll see we'll see that maybe quickly uh, at the end of the lab um, it's not really object oriented, but we will see during the lab how uh, we can build some structure, add methods on it, and so on. Go is a garbage collected language, uh, but, but it has a, a really efficient uh, garbage collect collector. Uh, every new release, there are some people performing some, uh, some benchmarks, and uh, Go is able to to garbage collect uh, 17 gigabyte of heap in under one millisecond. So the stop the world for your program is under a millisecond, which makes it quite efficient for uh, for production application. Okay, Go has pointers. Uh, we will see that later. Uh, don't worry about that. Maybe some people uh, have bad experience with pointers, uh, but it, this is really something uh, not so, so, it's not a big deal to, to be able to use pointers. It's a very light, uh, a light implementation of pointers. Uh, Go has also um, Go routines. Uh, we we hear quite a lot about Go routines recently. Uh, other language uh, try to to implement something similar. It's not a thread. It's a, it's a, an abstraction in, in on top of threads, and this makes it really really light and really easy to use um against other languages uh, that need uh, some thread uh, frameworks to to be able to to build concurrency so we we'll see that also uh, later in the in the lab and to be able to to communicate uh, between those uh, go routines you don't use uh, semaphores and, or, or logs and so on um go has a, another way of uh, implementing this it's channels. Uh, channels are like the, the pipes of, uh, of process you have on a Linux system. So you can build some pipes between your Go routines to make them uh, communicate together. Uh, we have uh, uh, some, 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 uh, some expression in Go. Um, you, you don't communicate by sharing memory, but you share memory by communicating. So this is uh, really the purpose of the channels. You don't have to, to synchronize uh, memory spaces to, to, to make some Go routines to speak together. You can use the channels to do, to do that. And the last point um, is uh, multiplexing. So you, you can listen on several channels at the same time. And we will see also this later in the, in the lab. All right. So uh, Go has quite a few keywords um, to manage dependencies. You have the 
import and package keyword. You have all the condition keywords, if, else, switch, case. Uh, we will see a bit in detail the difference uh, of the break and the fall through in the switch case. Uh, you have a go to in Go. Uh, like other language, it's not something you want to use very frequently, but at least it exists. Uh, you have the select for um, for the, uh, as I said it, for multiplexing. You have only one loop in Go. This is this makes it quite interesting. So if you want to iterate over structure, if you want to to do a simple loop uh, and so on, uh, an infinite loop, a while and so on, you can do uh, all of that with the um, in the with a for loop, uh, I will take the question of Jean Yves after that. Uh, we will we will stop for the requirements before starting, so it's fine. Yeah, yes, we'll take care of the queries if it comes, and uh, Sebastian, you may continue. Yeah, yeah. Um, then the typing system in Go. Um, in Go, you can have some structures, you have interfaces, functions, um, and we will see uh, you have uh, arrays, slice, and maps, and we will see all the all the possibility of the language for this. And you have uh, specificity uh, of the language, the the Go keyword that helps to start new go, go routine and panic recover is uh, the equivalent of the try catch for go uh, and uh, we will see that uh, later okay do you have any questions so far if not uh, are you sharing your screen yes i should share my screen yes do you all see my screen no I can see your screen. Uh, Jonathan, can you confirm? Yeah, I can see the screen as well. OK, thank you very much. So uh, installation. So you should all have uh, Golang in installed. Not GCC Go, but just the, 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 Go, the, the Go tooling uh, directly from the, the website or your package. As we will go to really through the basics of the language, we, we, we won't uh, play with dependencies and go modules one. Uh, just install a, a Go version and it, it, will, it will be fine. Uh, it cannot see my screen. Maybe try to refresh or join again the, um, the conference. Uh, so if, you, if your Go installation is is good. Uh, you should be able to take to type Go version in your in your console and see uh, everything fine. Here you see, still see my my terminal. So Go version, you could see everything. Uh, so Go in, is installed. I did. I, I didn't play yes, yesterday evening. I've heard that uh, Go 1.16 uh, has been uh, delivered, but I stayed with my previous version for the lab. It's not. It's not an issue uh, if you have 1.13 or 1, 1.14. It's it's fine. The, the 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 lab will will work also with older version of Go. It's not. It's not an issue. Uh, so, so now what you can do is to, to clone the repository. I will send you also in the comments the, the repo. Or maybe I can put the whole command. So you will just have to... Uh, Okay, here it is. Yes, even 111 or 113 will be fine for, for the lab. It's really basics for the language. We won't go to special features of uh, latest version and so on. What we won't do also is not go through all the, um, the core libraries of Go. Uh, in Go, you can do microservices. Uh, you, 
you can do quite a lot of things with the standard library. Uh, we will just use the, the basic for this. Uh, we'll just wait a few minutes. If everybody is able to, to clone the repository and open it uh, with their favorite tool, uh, you can use um, you can use a studio code with the Go plugin, uh, or uh, like I did uh, the um, IntelliJ or, or even the GoLens, the dedicated uh, Go environment from uh, from JetBrains is, is fine. So if you have any issue, raise hand and maybe we can talk to together to to fix this. And, uh, and if, if it's fine for everyone, we, we can start. Uh, you have also the slides in the, um, in the repository. Uh, so you can go to the, to the docs uh, repository folder and uh, just run a, a Docker Compose uh, up to be able to start, clone the repo. And then just open uh, your favorite uh, IDE on the on the repo, and we we will uh, we will meet in the in the Go hundred and the first exercise exercise uh, is the main dot go. Okay, if this is fine for everyone, I will continue. Just raise your hand if you have any any issue. If not. I will continue. Also, we can just uh, check up the status update by raising the hands, uh, Sebastian. That is like a quick vote, you know? Yeah. How many are with you or something like that? Yeah. So raise, what do we do? We, ra we raise hand if it's okay or if we have a problem? We raise hand if it is okay. And if someone is not, if someone is stuck in middle, then they can unmute yourself and speak up. That is a, it is a much better, I think, in the virtual yes. environment. Yeah. Okay, fine. May I ask? I got a um, tool fail to install. I'm use, using uh, Visual Studio Code. Go outline fail to install. Uh, is that something I need? <laughs> just, just check if you can open the one Go file. Um, from the the clone repository maybe the first the, in the first uh, folder the zero zero one uh open the main um did the um, did I studio code also already um ask you to to install the, um, the the tools yeah it did and and i get failed on that i can open the main.go in in zero one folder and do do you have um, do you have compilation working? If you if you after the dot, if you try to to auto complete the the functions the, the methods, is it if this is working, it should be fine. Uh, sorry, one more time. Up at the dots, and then after the dots, uh, do you have auto completion working? If you do the, I think control escape control space. Uh, do you have also a list of the the different function uh, appearing? Yeah, FMT function hello, import with uh, control space. Okay, if this is working, it should be okay. Maybe you can try to stop and restart the the studio code just to be sure. Maybe we'll try to install the the tooling again. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the few people who didn't raise hand, do you have some issue? No, they have actually, I think uh, they are so here with you. Raise back, okay. You are able to. Okay, fine. That's good, then majority of them has got it. Maybe we, Jonathan just, yeah, Jonathan has also done, I guess. So yeah, we can proceed. Okay, fine. Uh, so you, you will see the the tooling uh, when you install Go. Uh, you have quite all the tooling that comes with the language uh, package. That's quite nice. You can build uh, your binaries. Uh, Go has a um, source formatter that is called uh, Go FMT, Go FMT. You will hear a lot about uh, Go FMT. Um, it's not something that is mandatory, but 
most of the open source projects require you to format your source code with Go FMT before uh, re sending some pull requests and so on. Uh, Go comes also uh, with a, a test tooling. So you can write your own test with Go uh, next to your code, and you don't need to import some third part libraries and so on to be able to, to, to run your test, even if you will see it's a general philosophy of the language. The, the language comes with everything, and sometimes uh, to have some more comfortable uh, features, you can use some third-party libraries. But at least if you want something simple that works, you can use the basics of the language. Uh, you have um, a special uh, a special command that is go tool. With go tool, you you will be able to launch some debuggers and some other tools. So if you come from a, a Java a Java background, uh, you you will find some some tooling like you yeah, like you have with uh, JVM to be able to see uh, how much CPU you use, how much go routine you've started and where they are working and so on. So this makes uh, the, the Go language also production ready, ready because you have all the tooling to in investigate if you have some issues. Um, one of the of the, the, the problems and the, the, the thing that the committee is not very uh, very happy about, uh, at least was not, now it's getting better, is dependency management. So with GoGet, you can download some, some uh, libraries you, you, need, you want to use. And uh, things since uh, now two, at least two, two version of Go, and this is uh, one year uh, almost, since 1.13, I think. Um, you have a Go mod uh, tool that uh, appeared, and this helps you manage your dependencies uh, for the version versioning, uh, if you have uh, different versions of your libraries and dependencies in the language and so on. Um, we will not cover this topic today. Uh, we could spend the whole day on the topic uh, from itself. So just know that it exists and uh, that you, 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 can, uh, you can dig a bit in, on, the, on websites to, to see how this works. Okay, so now let's go. Um, so for each uh, each slide, we will go through the um, through the the folder that is associated to this slide, and we will comment, and we will be able to run a, a go command for the for the exercise and for what what we see. So first of all is uh, how a, a go program is organized. So we will see that you need to have a, a main package and a main function. If you don't have main functions on your Go program, then it's uh, it's meant to be a library. So if you have a main package and a main function, you will, you will be able to run your Go program on the command line. Um, if you need to import some uh, dependencies, here are FMTs from the, the standard libraries to be able to format some, uh, some string to, to print it. Uh, you can import it directly like this with this statement. And if we go uh, here to the, to the tooling, you will see uh, what I just uh, explained. And we will see how to run that program now. Um, in Go, all the files um, are UTF-8 encoded, which means you can uh, you can use uh, emoji and special uh, characters or Chinese character uh, directly in your source code. Uh, this is this is fine. So if if we if we go in the um, in the right directory and we run uh, go run main.go. This will execute our program, and we see here we have hello world. If you want to, to play a bit, we can also use uh, emojis, uh, hello world. You can use this, and if you run it again, we will see our emoji displayed on the console. This is fine. Um, so here I am. Uh, I'm on the Mac. You're also able to do this on Linux, Windows, and so on. And 
One thing that is also fine uh, is you can do cross compilation directly on your desktop for any other ar architecture. So here, if I want uh, to build um, a Linux binary for for uh, for my uh, from my my Macintosh, I just have to use two. Um, variables uh, go os and go arch so usually you say goose and gorge uh, so here i will build my um, my program as a toto and i just have to run it it's building and now i have here uh, my toto binary that is uh, ready for a linux a linux uh, computer I could do the same for Windows. Um, just to yes, this is a Linux RM uh, in in the and here we can set up the Windows. You can try that uh, also on your co on your comp computer. We will do all the labs together. Uh, the Go Arch, yes, it's working. And if I don't uh, put the output in .go, I will have a main.exe. Yes, here I have the main.exe for, for Windows. So now I can take that binary, give it to uh, my friend who is on Windows, and he will be able to run that, uh, that program directly. So this is quite, uh, quite nice when you have to do cross compilation. And about the size, uh, okay, it's two, two megabytes for Hello World, it's quite a lot, uh, but as it's uh, a garbage collected language and so on, you have also a part of the runtime that is embedded on the, on the binary. Uh, that's why it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit, um, it's a bit uh, bigger than uh, some other languages. Do you have any questions so far or fine for you? You were all able to, to run the program with the go run, uh, go run command? If you have anything, please feel free to unmute and speak up. Okay. What are the targets available? Uh, you can find this uh, on the website. Um, go OS support, and you should find the. Uh, you should find all your uh, okay. Darwin for uh, for macOS, FreeBSD, Linux. Uh, you have quite a lot of things. RM architecture are also supported now. You can do WebAssembly as I, I said before. So this is uh, quite a lot of architectures. It depends from from version to version. From Go, uh, some old architecture are removed, some new appear, and so on. So uh, I go to the documentation to have a complete list for this. Okay. Uh, there are more questions here. Yeah? Just show the the comments. Um, the build compiles everything in machine code. Is there some bytecode count in the middle layer between? Um, uh, uh, yes, there you, you have a, a whole compilation chain and um, I didn't show everything. We don't have time to, to show all the details for the implementation here, but um, I didn't mention something that is called um, the go pass. Um, and in the in the go pass, uh, you have a PKG, PKG folder, and in it you will have um, all the intermediate intermediate uh, compilations 
what can I show here? Uh, Golang, what do we have? Yes, you have .a files. Um, so so you, you you can you can find some intermediate there, there is also some cache for the um, there are also some some caching mechanism uh, so you don't have to compile everything each time and so on so at, I, again it's a, it's a beginner uh, lab so i can not dig in all the details we all, only have 3 hours so uh, if you if you need more information really go to the documentation it's quite quite complete Yes. All right, so we'll continue. Um, now we go to, to, the, to the importation uh, of, uh, of other packages. Um, the Go compiler is, uh, is quite strict. Um, we will see in, in, in the way you, you write condition and so on, you have to, to respect that there, there, there can, there is no, um, no discussion at the coffee machine. Do you put your brackets at the beginning or at uh, the end of the line? Uh, in Go, it's always on the same line. Uh, again, you, you cannot, um, you cannot declare some variable or so uh, libraries you want to use and not use it. If you do that, you have, you will have uh, compilation errors. So, um, all, all these, uh, all, all these features of the compiler and the, 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 the way it works makes your code always clean. People cannot work on your program, uh, add some variables and not use it. And then uh, it will break the compilation. So this is sometimes annoying, uh, but uh, I think on the long term, it's a good feature of the language to, to keep your, uh, your code files clean. Um, and by convention, the but when you import something, uh, the name of the um, the name of the package you import is the last of the package. We will see this in the in the example. So if we open uh, the second file, I will zoom zoom in a bit. Okay. So here um, we are importing like before the FMT package. We are also using here some uh, random numbers. So to be able to use the random packages and libraries, we have to, to import the random. And to initialize the, the random seed, we, we need the time, uh, the time package. So instead of just importing uh, th three times the import, 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 we can use uh, brackets here and put everything into brackets to have some factorized uh, imports. So now if we, if we run this, uh, uh, so I'm going to the, to the second folder. If we go run that file, we will see that we have random problems. And if I don't uh, initialize the random seed, uh, you see it was quite quick, but if I, if I uh, manually import the, the time package and don't, don't use it, uh, I will get a compilation error. And if I try to, to run again our problem, problem you, have a, you will have a, a warning that you used the, the imported the time package and you're not using it. So this, this, is, a, this is a nice feature. You, if, if you, you have to live with it and to deal with it. If you fight against the, the, the good tooling, uh, you, you will not take any pleasure of coding in Go, so just deal with it. That's my, my advice. And uh, if, I, uh, if I put again uh, the seed initialization with the time, here my program was, will work again. Okay for you? So I will continue. Um, 
How does Go handle uh, the um, visibility? Uh, how can we check the problems? I missed it. What do you mean by checking problems? At, if you try to compile, uh, if if you try to compile, it it won't compile. So you you will be able to see it directly uh, in your console or in your tool. Uh, if you run here, go run. It will tell you that line seven, uh, you are declaring a time package and you're not using it. How can we check the problem? Why do one get dot add different numbers of problem each compilation? Okay, okay. Yes, yes, it's just, uh, okay. Uh, okay, I didn't get, uh, you have one problem. It's just uh, some dummy printf. Uh, you have uh, one, uh, we, we could do some uh, IDs here. Uh, ID the same. You don't have a. It's not the program that is telling you that you have problem. It's just the printf uh, command here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fine. Um, so back to to identifiers. Um, in Go, when you want to to use a function or a variable outside its initial package, uh, you have to take care of. Um, of the um, visibility of your uh, function and so on. And in Go, you don't have um, public or private keywords like in Java and other languages. Uh, you handle visibility only uh, with um, capital uh, uppercase, with the case. So if you have uppercase, uh, your function or your variable will be public. And you, if you have lowercase, it will be uh, private. That's, this is something that is quite uh, surprising when you start. Uh, where, where is my mouse here? here. Uh, so if we, um, sorry, if we go to the number three, so if I declare uh, here a variable, uh, I'm invisible outside my, my package. As it starts with a minus e, uh, with a lower e, uh, it won't be you won't be able to use it uh, outside uh, your your main package. And if you put uh, capital uh, uppercase i here, you will be visible. Um, so, for example, if I try to to compile the number three uh, program. can try this also on your side. Go run again. It says uh, you cannot refer to an unexported constant that is called mat.py. It's undefined. Of course, we can fix this if you use uh, autocompletion. Uh, here, pi is a constant of the, the, the mat library. And here it will work. So if we run it again, mat.py, you see that it's the, you, you, you see here the, the value of pi. And the mat package exports the, the pi value by putting a capital P on the pi, uh, on the pi uh, constant. So it's, it's a bit different from what you see in other languages, but it's it works quite well uh, even in big programs. So if if you if you are building some uh, public open source libraries uh, that have to be used for for other people, um, then you you will you will play with this to make uh, some code or your interfaces public interfaces public uh, with copy, capital uh, capital case uppercase and uh, and if not uh, with lowercase all right any question no seems clear here yeah 
can we just have a sync up raise a sync up in uh, can we have a just sync up by raising the hand are you all at the same page with sebastian can you just raise the hand and yeah if you have any problems or any queries just unmute yourself and speak up or maybe put up a question okay perfect i think most Good. of them thank, thank you, you. um uh, i don't know you do you want a two minutes break or sh shall we continue if you want to continue raise hand again please okay so we'll go to until uh, half past 12 and then we have a lunch break fine um so how yeah, do we I just uh ask a quick, quick question here that I see in the chat. In, in example three, we created two variables and did not use it. Wasn't that not allowed was the question. Yes, fine. Um, they are outside the main, uh, the main functions, the main function. So this is fine. But if I, uh, if I use, if I put them inside my function, here we'll have the, the error. Because uh, we don't know, maybe someone uh, would use it as a global variable, and this is fine. But inside the function, if you don't use it, then the compiler uh, will complain that you're not using it. Okay, thank you. So he, here it's a local variable that you don't use, so you get an error. But if you leave it outside, uh, then it's a, a global package variable, and then the compi compiler cannot know if you, you want to use it maybe later in, a, in another file. And so it's, it's here. OK, I didn't see the, the question, fine. Uh, lower case function would approximate to Java, package private in Java. Yes, this is, this is the, the way it works. Uh, lower is private, and the upper is public. Fine. So how do we declare function in Go? Um, we have a special keyword that is called func. Uh, that's not, uh, not very difficult here. Uh, so you, you use func, and it's followed by the, by the function name. You have uh, to use uh, braces to, for the, the function body, and opening brace has to be on the same line as the func keyword. Uh, if you don't do that, if you, you put it under the under the, the func keyword, again, it won't compile. So uh, you, you, can't, uh, you can't go against this, so just, just live with it. Um, do you still see my, uh, my screen? Yes, okay, it's fine. Yes. Um, okay. How uh, do you do you declare function parameters? Um, a, a function in Go can have several parameters. You just uh, type in the name of the parameter and its type, and you separate them with uh, with a comma. And you can have uh, several uh, several parameters for a single function. So this is quite standard. The only thing, at least for me, coming from Java, uh, it's the opposite. In Java, you first give the type and then the, na the name. In Go, it's the it's the opposite. First the name, then the type. But it's, the, it's the, quite the only difference. Um, Returning values also, um, a Go function may return one or several values. So if you only have one value to return, then you just uh, add the returning value after the, the parameters in, uh, in brackets. So this is really uh, the basic declaration of a function in Go. Um, what I find interesting is you can also return several values. So if you want to return a string and a Boolean value, you can do it. And then you have to put the, the returning values also uh, between brackets for, for the, the compiler to know how many and in which order. And then when you return from your function, you return first 
the string and then the boolean condition. So you have to respect the declaration order of the return, um, the return values for your function. Um, to to have uh, smaller bodies and so on, this is just uh, some sh sugar sugar uh, sugaring of the of the language. Um, if you have several uh, parameters of same type. Um, you can do some factorization. So here we have BCD that are of the same type. We can declare BCD once uh, and declare the type only once. You don't have to put uh, the type every time. So this is all quite interesting. You can have uh, some smaller smaller code and uh, it's still readable. So so this is uh, this is fine. So we can have a look now uh, at the at the code for the force exercise. Uh, so here we have uh, several functions. So this is just the, the formatting of the. You can uh, you can play a bit and see how uh, do we we declare functions. Uh, so. Again, like I said, the func keyword. You have the name of the function then the parameters, and uh, as the function doesn't return anything, you don't have any parameters here. Uh, if we use the divide function, we have to take care that we don't divide by zero because this would lead to, to, to an error. So here we have two parameters from the same type that are integers. We declare them here and then we can declare uh, the result of the division and uh, an error if we will see later errors. Uh, it's one of the, the standard library types. Uh, it's like an exception uh, in Go. So we can declare an error uh, that uh, you are not allowed to, to divide by zero. And if B is zero, we return zero and the error. And if not, we can return the result and the zero value of an error here is nil. Question. Must a function be declared before it is used? Yes, yes. If you, if you re remove, for example, the, the diff here, you will get a, an error. Or a, at least you mean if I declare after, uh, now you can declare whatever the order, this, this is fine. Uh, but yes, you have to declare it. Okay. Uh, other thing that just I, I want to mention, uh, Go has uh, some Godoc. So if you if you start a comment just uh, above the the function with the name of the function, then you can comment about the function. And when you generate the documentation, it's like Javadoc, this will uh, document uh, by itself the, the function. So this is just good to, to know. If you have some complex function that uh, you have to, to explain, you can use uh, this way of commenting. And then how do we, do we use the, the function? I have an error. Put the diff again. You are. Uh, so you just call the, the function with the numbers, and this is fine. If we will see the, the, the variables just uh, after that, um, if you want to, to get the two results at the same time, you just say, OK, I'm using divide function. It returns uh, an integer for the result and eventually uh, an error you can get both uh, values in, in, at the same time on the return. So usually in Go, you have two, you maybe use three or more. Uh, I think two is a good practice, uh, even if you can use more. Uh, after two, it can be a, maybe a bit more complex to, to read. Uh, and now we will, uh, we will launch that. Uh, so if we go, the force 
question go solve the exception problem by not having exceptions yes we, are, we don't have exceptions we have errors and then you have to handle uh, carefully errors the pattern you will see very often in go here is beef it's so often that uh, usually the your your ide uh, has shortcuts to generate it uh, you call the function and the first thing you do after calling the function is check if the error is new, nil or not and uh, if not you do the error handling here and if not you let your program continue you can do some logging you can uh, so on so this is the the way of uh, of handling errors in uh, in go so if you run that go run the main uh, no main ah go run main that go you know a and b we can do the diff between 5 and 3 it's 2 5 uh, divided by 2 is okay uh, as we we use integers uh, the result is 2 it's rounded and uh, we cannot divide 5 by 0 so we get an error so this is uh, how we get the results and we call the functions seems type of variable need to be precise yes yes it's a statically typed language in go so you have to declare very carefully the type of your of your variables we will see this uh, in the next step uh, other other question no it's fine so we can we can continue uh, yes, I was talking about variables. How do we declare uh, variables in Go? So we have a, a special keyword that is var. Uh, so we use var, the name of the function, and uh, the, the type of the function, and the initialization, the initial value. This is the complete way of declaring uh, a variable in Go. Uh, if you give a type, you don't need to, to give the initial value if you want the, the zero value to be used. And we will see what are the zero values are for each type. So here, if you want to declare a string, we can say we have a variable string, it's called name, and we set its initial value to an empty string. This is fine, but you don't have to do it because um, if you give an initial value, uh, the, the language is clever enough to infer the type. We know it's a, it's a string, you, so you don't need to, to tell the language you declare a string. And on the other hand, uh, if you say it's a string, as the zero value of a string is an empty string, uh, you just can declare a var name string. An empty string has not a nil or null value, it's empty. So here the, the three declarations are the same. It will lead to a new variable called name uh, with an uh, empty, empty string as its initial value. Um, you can also use the factorized uh, description for uh, variables. So you can put them into between, between, um, between braces. Um, you can declare them uh, on several lines. So we are declaring different variables. So Toto is an empty string. Uh, TT is a float and Tata is a boolean. So the the, lang the, the, the Go compilator will know that uh, the, which type uh, is used for each uh, each of these variables. Um, you can also uh, use one-liners. Uh, you can declare several variables on the same line, even if they have different types. Uh, Really, 
in production programs, I don't uh, advise you to, to use this. It's not something that is really readable, uh, if you have, especially if you have different types. So you can do this if you have uh, same types and same types declaration like this. Uh, X, Y, Z, uh, but if you use uh, three different variables, one is a string, one is an integer, and the second one is a Boolean, uh, this will not help your colleagues uh, for debugging and so on. So I don't advise you to, to do that. Okay. Um, to, again, we have some, uh, some, uh, some sh sugar, sugar, notation here. Um, if you want to declare and to initialize a variable, uh, instead of doing the var a, uh, the type and the value, you can use a short declaration uh, that is a semicolon uh, colon equals. So this is the same a uh, colon equals plop. Uh, is the same as var a equals plop. So you do the declaration and the initialization at the same time. So this is quite interesting and you, it's, it's a short, short notation uh, only. Uh, just keep in mind, we will see in the, in the go file, uh, colon equals is declaration and assignation. Whereas the equals is just assignation. So if you declare twice with a colon equals a variable, you will lead an, you will have an error because it's like you declared twice the same variable. We'll just see it in the in the go files too. So if you open the fifth, here it is. In the previous exercise, I tried to replace output values type with float 32. Yes. And so you get, uh, I guess you get, uh, you get an error because here we said it's an int. Yes. If you, if you say it's returning a float, you also say it, it has a float as parameter because you only can do operation between homogeneous. Uh, that we will again see it just uh, the next step. Here we get an error because we are dividing floats and returning an init. So, or you cast it here, or you said everywhere you are using float 32. And then this will be fine here. That's the way of dealing. You have to be homogeneous uh, in your in your uh, computation. You can use it. We will see it just uh, in the next step. No, no toboxing in Go. You have to be explicit for every type conversion. It's. Uh, it's a security that comes to the cost of uh, having to, to write everything each time. Uh, but at least when it compiles, you're quite, uh, quite sure that everything works fine. Um, so here you have a uh, free declaration of three different types. ABC, one is a Boolean. This is the free version of the same Boolean value at, at last, at the end. Uh, then we will use again uh, printf to display the value and the type of the of the, the parameter. And here you see we have z equals to false. Um, if you if you want to to use again z here to say uh, z uh, equals true, you can do it. Just an assignation, but if you put again a, a column here, you will get an error saying that uh, it's not a new variable. You're trying to declare twice the same z, and this leads to an error. Um, 
one thing that is interesting, as we can do uh, assignment on the same line, if you want to write uh, a function that gives you the, the, the uh, Fibonacci number, you don't need some temporary variable to, to do the exchange. You can write it on a one-liner. This is uh, also a nice feature of the language uh, that is a bit surprising when you, you're not used to it. So here uh, we declare the age, the name, and a Boolean uh, alive of John. So John is a 13-year-old 13, 13 man who is still alive. We can declare every three variable on the same line, and we use here the colon to declare. And we know age is, a, is an, uh, an integer. Uh, age is an integer, name is a string, and alive is true. And this, this will work fine. So if we go uh, to the fifth lab and do the go run here, all our booleans, we will see that you have John, and this gives you the 20s uh, Fibonacci number. And here, if we do like I did, z equals true. If I try to compile this, I will get an error. There are no new variables left on this side of the assignation. And this will lead to an error. But if I put here a QWERTY, You will tell me that I'm not using it, <laughs> that I get, uh, so I get the, the compilation error. So if I wanted to, to compile, I have to use QWERTY somewhere in my function or the, um, the, the, compilite, the, the compilator will complain. So now I can run it again. And uh, yes, I didn't change the name here. We have our QWERTY that is true. Okay, do you have questions so far? Uh, auto boxing are already in answered, like in Java, when int and float makes intent to get a built in float. No, explicit uh, cast, uh, casting is needed in Go. I think we will see just after that. Um, so what are the, the basic types in Go? So we have Boolean strings, uh, you have all the, the, the different size of integer from uh, 8 to 64 bytes in integers. The same for unsigned integers. Um, if you use int alone without specifying if, it, if it's uh, int 16, 32, or 64, uh, it will depend on the platform uh, where you compile your program. If you're compiling your Go program on a 32 bytes processor uh, system, uh, int will be a 32 length, a 32 bytes length. And if you do it on a modern computer uh, with 64 bytes architecture, you will get an integer that has 64 bytes. So if you run your program on different uh, architectures, uh, my advice is to always uh, put the length uh, and the, 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 the precise type of the, the variable you are using. So you won't have uh, any, any issue for, with this. Um, we have a byte type. Uh, it's just uh, an alias for uh, an eight uh, length integer. And um, a rune uh, is a 32 byte uh, integer. It's used to represent uh, a, a character, so a Unicode code point. And we have the inside in pointer uh, that is a value that is large enough to contain uh, the, the, the content of a, a pointer address. So depends also if it's a 32 or 64 bytes. And uh, we have, uh, we don't have double, but we have floats. 
also 32 or 64 lengths. Uh, and this is quite interesting. You don't use it every day, but uh, you have complex numbers and uh, you can uh, perform complex operation uh, in Go. Uh, so you can, uh, you, you also have 64, uh, 128 bytes uh, complex value for cryptographic maybe uh, computation and so on. This can be useful. So the image and imaginary number E uh, is part of the of the language. The size of the answer pointer varies by compilation target arch. Yes, this is it. Yes. Uh, so we have quite a, a large variety of uh, of types. Um, I used to work in in the IoT uh, in IoT companies where we were um, communicating with small embedded device and uh, it was quite interesting to be able uh, to use uh, only eight bytes integer when you have to communicate with such device uh, then you have lower memory print or memory usage on the on the line so it's quite interesting for embedded uh, communication to to work with uh, with uh, with go uh, like C or other languages, but at least in Java you don't have to the such a, a panel of uh, types, and uh, here it's it's an interesting uh, interesting feature. Um, I was talking uh, before about zero values, um, so zero values. <clears throat> All the numeric types uh, have zero as zero values. This is, uh, this is uh, yes, <laughs> obvious. Uh, Booleans, uh, when, you don't declare, when you declare them without assigning a value, an initial value, um, they have false value. And the, the strings uh, are empty. We will see later. Uh, pointers uh, have a zero value of nil, which is the equivalent of uh, null for, for other languages. But for all the, the country types here, uh, it's zero, false, and empty. And that was uh, our uh, Jean Yves question before. Um, you have to, to do explicit type conversion. Yes, for float it's 0, 0. Yes, we will see it in the in the code source. Um, you have to to do explicit type conversion. So um, if you want to to convert here uh, our integer e to a float, you have to cast it uh, explicitly uh, using the the name of the of the type to do the the conversion. So we will go to the number six lab. Zoom in a bit. Uh, so here we, we declare uh, different, uh, different parameters and we will display uh, their type and zero value, which will be interesting to see what X and uh, the string zero value is. And then here uh, we do some uh, computation and type conversion uh, from an integer to a float. And if we if we run that, you can do the same and uh, play a bit with the example uh, at the same time. So we see. Uh, Okay, it says float has a value of zero. The string is empty. Uh, here the type is 42 and we convert it to a 42 uh, float. We can change a bit the, um, the, the printf value. If we printf uh, here our float Uh, okay, uh, I don't like that. Uh, it's a float, okay. And if we, we run it again, 
you have a default precision and we have 42.0 and this comes from the integer 42 that we converted uh, to, to, the, um, to the type float. And we can say that we want a 2.2 precision. So this is usual printf uh, formatting that you can find in other languages also. So here I can uh, reduce the number of trading zeros just by setting the right format. And we see the, the maximum value of the unsigned pointer here. And the complex value, also we can print complex and use complex numbers. So here the complex is the, the square root of minus five plus 12e e is the imaginary number. Do you have any question? No, so far so, so good. So we know how to, to declare function variable and now we can start to play also with, uh, with those numbers and variables. So uh, next step, conditions. Um, in Go, uh, we have the if, like uh, any other language. Uh, the same uh, as before uh, for functions, the opening brace uh, has to be on the same line of the if, uh, deal with it again. Uh, and then the closing can be, uh, of course, uh, a bit uh, on, uh, on another line, this is fine, but the opening uh, has to be here. Uh, sorry. You can use all the Boolean expression that you know in the language, uh, equals, different, lower than, greater than. Uh, you have the logic and and the logic or that you can use also uh, in, uh, in Go. So we can see how this works. So we declare two integers, a and b, and uh, we check if a is lower than b. Um, we can also, uh, maybe, I, did I skip that? Yes, maybe I skipped that. Um, when, you are, um, when you are using an, an, an if statement, you have uh, the condition that is here, but you can use um, an initialization uh, expression on the same line of the if, and then uh, with a semicolon, you split it, and then you put the con condition. So here we can compute the value of C, uh, that is two times A minus B, and then we can compare C and A. So it's the same as if we would do this just on top, uh, minus B. It's the same, both are working. Uh, it's just uh, another facility of the, of the language to be able to to read it more in a more easier way. Uh, you do the computation. You can also call a function here. You could have a function, uh, compute my parameter C and then check the value. And uh, what I was saying, if, if I put this here, I get an error here stating that uh, the, my, uh, my brace is missing. So you have to, to do this in the Go FMT way. And if you you run the number seven, yes. Run it again. You have three that is lower than five and one that's lower than three. This is what we expect. Okay, do you all see? my screen so we are back where we left uh, at the if conditions 
Uh, raise hand up if you're all there and ready, and if you see my screen. Okay, nice. Perfect. All right. Um, so we were talking about the, the if and the conditions. Uh, what we saw also in the example is that you can add some initialization expression in the if itself before testing the condition. That's what we, we saw. Um, there is also uh, questions. No, okay, it's just uh, for, for employees. Okay, um, if you are if you have uh, more condition, more clause, you can add them in uh, else if and else conditions. So this is quite standard for 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 languages. Uh, and now you will have to, to work a bit. We have some small exercise for you. Uh, we will see the the file in a few seconds. So. What I'm asking here is to write a function that is computing the inverse of a decimal number, and then we will try it uh, with a few few numbers, and of course zero to see if you handled quite good uh, this case. Uh, so what we can what you can do is having the function return the result and the boolean value, and the boolean value says okay if the number uh, has been inverted and false if it could not be inverted. Uh, so I'll let you a, a few seconds. And if someone wants to, to share its screen to, to show the, the result, uh, it's, it's OK. So now we are, we are, we are. Come on. Yes, so it's the follow eight exercise. Uh, of course, you have uh, the solution, but uh, please don't re check the solution immediately. Uh, float return, integer, float, uh, float everywhere. Float, uh, you, you take a float as a parameter and you return, uh, you return also a float and a boolean. Uh, so you can check if someone gives you zero, you can just return false and zero. So you will able to define uh, a function with one parameter in, two parameters out, call the function, and uh, use the, the if to see uh, to see how it works. If the result is not cannot be computed, then you display something else. You display something else. And if someone is okay to share his screen, you're welcome.
So how do we do that? That someone is someone ready to to share the screen, or you prefer if I do it like you want? Raise up, raise hand, or give a chat if you if you're okay to share your screen. It's a bit, a bit more dynamic than if I do everything. Uh, I didn't see who raised the hand. If you wanted to raise a hand, you can unmute and speak up also so that we can identify because some of the people have. OK, yep. so we'll build the inverse function. Uh, so it takes, a, let's say, float, float 32. Uh, float. Ah, come on. <laughs> a float 32 uh, called the uh, number. And as a result, we have here two results. We have again float and a Boolean to be able to know if the, the computation was fine or not. Uh, so first thing first, if, uh, if the number equals to zero, we cannot compute it. And so we return zero uh, and false. That's fine. So far, so good. And if not, we can return the opposite inverse one on number and then true. Here we are. So we can call the function uh, x here. Uh, we call it with inverse, inverse of x. And this is the result, result. Uh, and OK. So here we have the, um, OK, float 64, OK. Because my Mac is a 64, we use 64, of course. It's easier. So we won't have to cast everything. All right. Uh, so we compute the inverse. We have the result and stating if it's OK or not. Uh, uh, is that number? So here we use the print f. Res and uh, okay. Um, here is the parameter for Boolean, it's a T. Uh, and as we don't know how to, to make loops so far, we will do the game the same again here. And uh, if I don't declare. I don't declare these twice because I will have an error if I use the uh, the colon. Uh, so here we are. And so if we go now to uh, eight exercise and we do the go run main dot go. Of course, I forgot about line return. Here we are. So the inverse of three, one of three, zero dot 33, it's, you can, you are able to compute it. And uh, if you pass zero, you would get an error. So we said you cannot, Compute it. Um, if I remove this, just to see what happens, and I run, uh, it it has been fixed a few. Previously, you had a, an error, uh, and since a few releases of Go now, uh, it says it's infinity you don't have not a number or something like that. 
just good to know. Okay. Uh, I don't have the comments anymore. I think there are some comments. Okay, no, it's fine. Okay, so far for you, so good. Uh, so we continue now um, the exercise and the presentation. So yes, uh, next step uh, is loops. Uh, in Go, we have only one loop, that is the for loop. So it's the loop like you know it for, for with uh, other languages. Uh, it has three components. You have to initialize uh, the declaration. This is uh, executed once uh, before the iteration. Then you have a Boolean uh, condition uh, that is evaluated before uh, each iteration. And after that, you can do the incrementation or another computation uh, after each iteration. So, so far, nothing new for the, for the for loop. Um, this is what it looks like. And uh, again, you don't need to, to put um, brackets uh, for, for, uh, be, be for the, the free conditions. The only thing you have to, you know now, uh, is to have the braces at the end of the line uh, on the same line as the four. So this is quite, quite usual. Um, The, the loop, of course, uh, is evaluated here uh, until the condition uh, is not true anymore. And this is, uh, this is done at each iteration, and this is done once for the, the initialization. Uh, and you see here the scope uh, for E is just for the for loop, and uh, we do declaration and initialization here uh, once with the, the colon, colon uh, equals. Okay. Um, the initialization uh, part is not mandatory and uh, the incrementation part also. So uh, you could write a for loop only with the condition. Uh, this is uh, equivalent to a while while uh, n uh, is less than 1,000, then do the iteration. So we'll have a look at this on the, this file. Then you can play a bit with it. Um, here we declare a, a sum outside of the loop and we compute uh, the sum, all the numbers from zero to nine inside the loop. So if you run this, we have 45. Uh, you can transform this a little bit uh, like this. And you can initialize uh, E equals to zero here and uh, do the summing is the same and E plus plus. This works also, you can run it and you have the same results. And you can also do a for loop like this and uh, add a condition if uh sum is superior to 20 and do the break and this will run also and uh, so you see here we have a, an infinite loop you can use this later we will see as the the main loop for uh, for a go routine that has to to work on itself so here are the the for the while and the infinite loop you can all do do all of of three of them uh with a single for command did you try it 
Do you have any question? If not, we'll continue. Then uh, switch, switch condition. Uh, the switch as for the if and the for. Uh, you, you can add an initialization uh, command before evaluating the expression. And then you will have the different cases, case A, case B, and the default case. Again, this is something uh, something uh, really uh, like any other languages. We have one difference in Go. Um, the break is not necessary in the case. Automatically, when a case is uh, reached, uh, it will break. So in Go, we have the opposite logic. If you want to go to the next case, you have to add um, a special keyword, which is fall through. And this is the, a bit different from the other languages. Uh, we will see that in the next example. Uh, another thing that is a bit uh, unusual, in the switch, um, the, the condition part can be omitted. And you can directly write the different cases, and this can be used to 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 do nice uh, else if the, if then else switches in a in a more readable way. So no, it exists. Usually, uh, people prefer to do if if else or else if and so on. Uh, but no, you can uh, you can use it uh, this way. To, to be able to have uh, some uh, well-formatted code for this. Uh, we'll see what it looks like here. OK. So here we have a, a switch, which will try to guess uh, which day of the week we are. So here we have our special case fall through. So in, in, our, in our switch loop here, um, if we are Saturday or Sunday, we want to execute the same code as to say it's the weekend. Uh, if it's Friday, we will say it's soon the weekend, but not yet. And uh, any other day, this is our default goal or default target, we will say it's too long before weekend. So we can, uh, we can run this. And yes, hopefully it's weekend. And uh, so just see the the special uh, special way of using the, the fall through here. So if you have different case and you want to execute the same code for different cases, uh, you can uh, add it here. If I don't do anything, uh, good question. If I don't do anything here, and we are Saturday, should display nothing? Yes, it displays nothing. And not even the default one, it displays nothing. And if I put again the full through, then it's weak. All right, fine for you? No question for, the, for this. Then we'll continue. OK, so now we have all the basics. Uh, you can work with uh, integers, float. You know how to declare functions and so on. Uh, now, usually what you want to do is to try to work with uh, specific types. We will see how to, to build new structures uh, in a few minutes. But first thing, um, you can declare your own types. Uh, and you can use uh, numeric types uh, as parents. They are not really parents, more it's the underlying type that you, you define. So if you want to define a new type that is a, a distance in meters by second, for example, or duration, that is something that is already done uh, in the standard library of the Go, 
of Go. Of Go. Um, they define a duration uh, that is a uh, 60 byte integer, 64 byte integer. And we can do the same with the distance. This is quite interesting um, because then, uh, could you define a limited type range? No, no, it's just uh, the type. You could use uh, uh, integer uh, eight eight uh, byte integer, but no, you cannot limit to a certain size. Um, then once you have declared your your new types, you can declare variables using these types. For example, a distance d, a time t, and if you try to do the computation, you will get an error because you have to go back to the underlying uh, common types to be able to do the computation uh, because Go does not allow to do operation on types that are not homogeneous. So if we have a look at step 11, it's the example that we have in the slide. So here we declare a new distance type that is a float64 float time also and a speed so we want the speed to be meters by seconds we have to compute the speed again if time is zero we will get an error but if you want to uh, take distance time and return speed for the computation we see here we have to go back to float to do the computation and then we can cast it the final result to speed and print it return it in the function so uh, if i remove for example uh, here the float 64 i'm trying to um, even the speed so i remove everything I'm trying to do operation between speed and distance. This is not working. So I have to go back float before, which is the underlying tip type. Sorry. Here again, float 64. And if here we would return float 64, this would be fine. But we'll... how about enums with Yota? Uh, so I choose not to mention constants and enums and Yota in the in the lab. Um, we can have a few words about this later. Uh, but for just we don't we won't mix uh, everything here. Um, so just here, we have uh, distance and speed divided. Uh, if you want to return the new type, we define speed. We have to, to cast the whole result to speed. And then it will work. Just I have to spell properly speed. Um, if I um, if I declare here uh, a var speed of type speed, and I want to to uh, assign it here, uh, what does it say? No new variable, of course. But if here I put a float sixty four. I will get an error because we are expect, expecting uh, a type speed as a return and we don't get it. So uh, you you can really really play with the with the types in Go to be sure that uh, what you return is of good type and uh, avoid lots of errors. Uh, 
if you compare to other untyped languages. It's a bit, uh, sometimes a bit uh, heavy to, to manage and you have a lot of code to write, but, um, but uh, it avoids much of uh, the errors. What is the point of defining distance and time if we have to cast them go back? Yes, here it's a simple uh, example. Um, same as methods with capital letters. What are the rules for exporting package type? Yes, yes, of course, it's the same. Uh, if you want to, to build a, a, a speed library and you want uh, your clients to use it, you, you would have to, to put a capital, uh, capital C, uppercase C, to be able to, to share it. Yeah, yes. Uh, uh, I, uh, my question was about uh, this is Andrew. Uh, my question is the the type time. If I write it with a capital letter, is it exported to the? Uh, yes, sorry, yes. And if the lowercase, it's not exported; it's internal. Yes, of course, that's it. It's the same. It's the same rule for the types, for the structures, for the for everything. And. What the and the, um, the purpose of this uh, here? It's a it's a basic example, but if if you if you have a more complex uh, more complex types uh, and you want to enforce your users uh, to 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 use your types, for example, if you have a, I don't know distance and you um, people can just use float sixty four. Uh, maybe they will ask themselves uh, what is the unit of distance you are using in your program. If you define a type and you do some documentation to explain they are, uh, they are in meters, uh, you can avoid some compute, compute errors and so on. You can also create a speed DMT if you want. Yes, yes, you you could uh, you could do that, of course. the The point was to you have to divide uh, homogeneous units. So the the point if if here we have distances, we could convert here time in uh, in uh, in distances. And this would also allow to, to do the computation because we divide distances by distances and it's fine. But it's more for, uh, for the example that uh, I did that. Okay, the uh, answer everything, I guess so. So we continue. So now, uh, level up, uh, we are talking about structures. So in, in Go, we don't have objects, uh, but we see it's, we have some uh, really close, uh, close, uh, close patterns to, to objects. But the first thing, um, how if you want to describe uh, some objects from, um, from your problematics if you want to, to to visualize some vectors and some how, how can you do to define a, a vector so in go we have um, structures so you will define a new structure uh, like we did for the for new type so it's a new type just the, the previous slide uh, we also declared new type but it was uh, from the underlying type in integer 64. Here, here we are defining uh, a new structure that is a vector. And the vector is a collection of fields. So you will just tell uh, the compilator that you are defining a new structure that, is, that has two coordinates, x, y, that are integers. Uh, what's the question? Okay, it's just a remark, not a question. So this is how you define uh, a new structure with its uh, field. And 
then how how do you do to to initialize your new structures? So to to instantiate your your structure. You would just call uh, the name of the structure and uh, use braces to initialize in the same order uh, as you declared it in the structure, the fields. So here we have x, y in this order, first x, then y, then vector of one, two would initialize a new vector with x equals one and uh, y equals two. If you if you don't want to initialize the whole structure, you could just you could just uh, initialize it with an empty empty braces. Then x and y would use their zero value, which is zero for uh, numbers. And if you want only to initialize one of the two, then you can add a, a label to to say uh, okay, x equals to one and not to zero. And uh, y here is not declared, so it would take its zero value, which would be y. Okay. Uh, so if we if we have a look to the Go code, so here we here we um, we can declare a new structure vertex. As they are of the same type, we can uh, declare them both on the same line. X, Y is an int. Uh, we could add a Z, uh, that is a float, 64 if you want. This, this, could, be, this could work. Um, as you noted here, X, Y, and Z are capital uh, uppercase. So you will able to, um, to access them. If I put Z here, uh, people won't be able to, to do the initialization. If I put a three here, okay, here I'm in the same package, so it's working, but someone else uh, would not be able, uh, someone outside of the package, if you do a library and so on, wouldn't be able to uh, access to, to Z just for you to know. Uh, so here we declare everything in the right order. And uh, here we only declare x equals one and so on. So here you can play with, uh, with your structures like that. And if, you, if we uh, execute this, oh, we are already. 11 and we run it. Ah, this was the speed, sorry. We are already at 12. Okay, here are our vertex, vertex one, two, three, one, zero, zero, and the one that is not uh, initialized at all, every value is zero. Okay, so far. So now, um, how do you access the fields of a, of, of a structure? So you just have to use the dot operator like in any other languages. Uh, so to, to access uh, the, the, the X value, you just type the V dot X and you have access to that value and you can set it, get it, and so on. So the 13, uh, 13 is already a pointer, sorry. So yes, what we didn't do here, if we want just to, to print one coordinate, uh, we could do the print line and we can do the V1, for example, but the Z, uh, or maybe what we can do, be clever, uh, V3 dot Z equals, no, one, two, three. And if we run that again, 
we see that the last element of our structure has been updated. Okay, fine. So that's it for structures. Uh, you can have some uh, advanced usage of structure because you can embed structures in other structures. Uh, but again, this this is uh, this is a 101 course, so I will not enter in uh, in, in this. Um, in Go, you don't have a uh, inheritance her of structures. You can do composition. Uh, so there are some uh, something you have to, to take care to, uh, but you will have to, to have a look at this on, on, on your own. Okay, now one of the, of the big parts, uh, we are talking about pointers. Um, so in Go, you have the choice to, uh, to use pointers or not. So a pointer uh, is just, you, you could see it uh, like a link to the memory, uh, to the memory address of uh, a variable or a structure or even a, a function or something like that. It's something that points to uh, the place where the, the, the variable or the, the type you are referring to is set in memory. So if you want, to declare a pointer, uh, you have to, to use the, the white kite, the star operator. And so if you if you read this, this is read, read like uh, p is a pointer to an integer. So we'll see how to, to manipulate and to, to use the pointers. So here we first declare a, a, a pointer to an integer, like it's called p, and we declare um, a value uh, variable e that is of value 42. And to make p to point to that value, uh, we use the ampersand uh, character. So now p points to the address of the variable e that we just initialized. And from now on, we will, we will be able to use p um, to modify the value of e that is stored somewhere in the memory of the, of the program. Uh, maybe you could just raise hand. Who is familiar with pointers? Uh, just raise hand, just to, to, to know. OK, it's a bit more, uh, more of the half. OK, so you're, how many people are we here now? Almost 50. OK, so half of the group is familiar with pointers. So we'll play a bit uh, with pointers to see how, uh, how to, to handle that. And uh, I told you already this morning, the, the zero value of a pointer is nil. It's a, it's a special value of the, the language. It's nil, uh, sorry. Here it's called nil for the for the Go language. Um, so once you have a pointer, if you want uh, to to do something with that pointer, you will have to use also the the star operator, the same that is used to declare a pointer. So if we have uh, i equals to three, now we build a pointer uh, that points to I um, with the ampersand uh, character. If we just print P, we would print the address in memory of uh, the, the containing the pointer. If we want to print the value of uh, I that is referred by the pointer, we will use um, the special character uh, here, the star, to be able to, to display free. And on the other side, if we want to change the value of i through the pointer, we just say, OK, modify the content of the pointer, uh, p, and replace it by 21. And this will modify then the i that uh, is declared uh, in, in the first place.
You can do the same with structures. So you can declare, for example, a vector like we did before, and you can create a pointer uh, to that vector using its address with the empath end. And one of the to make it to make it more easy to use for structures you don't have to add the the star characters if you do the pointer dot x you will be able to modify directly the fields of a structure without having to put uh, the the wildcard characters before the the pointer. So we say we say in Go, uh, in direction of the pointer is transparency uh, because you don't have you can put it, but it's uh, again some uh, ease of use of the language to to make it not mandatory. So before doing the exercise, I will show you. Uh, no, here. I will show you how it works. So here we here we declare two integers. Now you you're fa familiar with this description, and uh, we declare a new pointer that points to i here uh, that equals to forty two. It points to e. So first we will print p. Uh, we can also, if you want print uh, the value of the pointer directly. So we will see both of them. Then we use the pointer to modify the, the value of y, i. Uh, so we, we use the star character and we assign a new value to the content of the pointer. So it, this will modify e, i here. Uh, so we'll see how this happens. Then we change the value, the, the pointer. The pointer doesn't point to i, but to j. <clears throat> and we do uh, some operation, and we divide j by 37, and we will print the value at the end. And we will see uh, that uh, the value of j has been modified. OK? Uh, so 13. And we run it. So that's that's what I was telling you. So this is the value of the pointer. So here, if we print p, that is a pointer, we get the memory address of i. In the that is that is printed. Then we print i. Initial value is forty two. Then we change the value to 21 for the pointer. And then we do the, the, the same operation. And we divide uh, j by uh, 37. And then we get 73. So the advantage of, uh, of doing this using pointer uh, is if you don't use pointers, every time you call in a function a value, it is copied. And then when you do modification to the value uh, inside your function, the value uh, of the, the value of the, the variable outside of the function will stay the same. If you use pointer, you will able to modify the value of the variable that is uh, related to that pointer. So we will see this in the in the next steps and in the exercise. So the exercise here is a bit a bit long, so you will be able to to say the. We will do this to, together. So I'm I'm displaying the the exercise. We will do some pointer operation uh, with structures and so on. So please, uh, you can give the answers on the chat, and we will check if it's okay or not. So first, if we go to the thirteen exercise. Here it is. If we run it, we don't have any answer yet. So what do we do? 
we have a new structure that is called uh, a person, a person as a name, an age, and also a pointer to another person, which is a friend. Okay, so far. And uh, we did also some new, we introduced some new type, which is an age that is an, an integer. So first thing, we create a new object, a new structure called person, which is John. John is 25 years old and has no friend. And we initialize a pointer on that structure. So pointer to John. First thing, we increment through the pointer to the structure, the age of John. So what uh, do we expect as a result for the first question? Is the, the age of John still equal to 25? 25, sorry. Yes or not? You can put the answer in the, in the chat if you want. So we will see I'm, I'm not alone. So what, what is the age of John after we increase uh, the value of the age in the structures through the pointer? Any ID? Don't be shy. 25 false, yes. No, it's not 25 anymore because uh, it has been uh, increased, of course. So first is false and then next is true. Because when you use the pointer, um, you can increase the age uh, without having to write this. This is the same as this. Pointer to John plus plus equals to, uh, to this. So you, you can remove all this notation. So it's really easier to use and you don't have to put uh, braces everywhere. Okay, fine. So we check if it's okay. Correct, correct, fine. So we continue. Um, we create a pointer on the age of John. So we take the, not the address of the structure of the structure John, but directly on his age. And we initialize a new person, that is Bob. Bob is 26, and Bob has a friend who is John. And what do we do also is um, we create a pointer also on the age of Bob. So we have pointers of both ages, and we have a new person initialized. So, um, is pointer of age of John equal to pointer of age of Bob? What do you think? True or false here? False. Uh, you're right. Uh, the value of the ages are the same, but here we compare uh, pointers. So we are comparing uh, the, the memory address. And uh, as Bob and John are two different persons, their memory address of their ages are not uh, on, the same, uh, on the same line. And so this, of course, is false. Because we are not comparing the content of the ages, but the value, uh, the address in memory. Okay, we are fine. Expected keyword seems not working. Expected keyword. Ah, uh, it's not a keyword. It's a feature. It's a feature of IntelliJ. Uh, IntelliJ, when um, when you declare um, when you declare a structure uh, to prevent some errors, it just shows you the the name of the fields. But it's not the um, it's not a feature of the language. It's a feature of the of IntelliJ. Look, yes, you you don't have to put expected here. You just put false, and it will be fine. Okay. Other question. Um, 
is the content of the pointer to the age of, of John uh, equal to the age of Bob? So we have a pointer to the age of uh, John here. John is 26. One question, if we pass this person structure to a function, will the whole structure be cloned? We will see in functions, you can directly pass pointers to structures, but if you pass the structure, the whole structure will be uh, cloned. Um, so if you have want to have some good memory management, it's not a good practice. And if you pass directly a structure to a function and you modify the fields inside and you return, the fields will not be modified. But if you pass the pointer, then you can modify in the structure the, um, the fields of the, of the structure. So to go back here, uh, so the pointer to the age uh, of John equals to age of John. Of course, because we got the content and both are 26. So here it's true. And if we check it, still correct. Okay, then we use the pointer to the age of John and we assign it 10. So, um, is the content of the pointer to the age of John equals to the age of John? Of course, it points to the same value and we use the star operator. So both are the same. It's 26, which is the age of our friend John. Then we increase directly from the structure the age of John. And we ask the same question. Are the content of the pointer still the same? Of course, it is also true, but I have to put the value. Uh, both are pointing to the same memory uh, address and it's fine. So if we run this, it's still the same, fine. Then we set back the age of John to the content, to the pointer, to the age of Bob. So doing this, we will restore the age of John to the age of Bob. And we ask again the question, uh, by doing this, does the pointer still uh, point to the good value? Of course, this has not been changed. And we check here, correct. Then we change uh, the age of Bob through the pointer. We set the age of Bob equals to 18. So of course, does the, the initial structure have changed? Yes, it has. So here it's true also, because we use the pointer to modify the value of the age of Bob. Still okay. Then a bit more tricky. Bob's friend, um, Bob's friend, if you remember, is John. So we use a pointer. So the age of Fred, uh, Bob's friend, that is John, uh, is increased to the age of John, uh, to the age of Bob plus one. Uh, the age of Bob is 19, plus one is 18. So Q8, true, of course. So we use the, the pointer, through the pointer, uh, we could modify the age uh, of, uh, of John. And we will check again, still correct. So finally, uh, then <laughs> we make Bob his own friend and uh, we change the, uh, the, the age of uh, Bob's friend, which is himself, to 20. Uh, 
do we expect the age to be also 20? So it's a, it's a bit more tricky, but it's true. Uh, as um, yes, we, we, we set Bob to be his own friend and we, through the pointer, we are modifying the, the value here. It's true. And the last one, um, again, we make sure that Bob's friend is himself. And then we change uh, the value of the friend of the friend to John. <laughs> yes, also true. So we make Bob his own friend. And in the structure of Bob's friend, so you have Bob. And finally, you said fr the friend of friend of Bob is John. And uh, so you're modifying uh, Bob directly. So the, the pointer to the friend of Bob is the pointer of John. And finally, true. It's a bit of a, of a gymnastic, but uh, it's over. Uh, so what do you think? Are you a bit more... Uh, did you get all the subtleties of the, the exercise? Uh, thank you, uh, Heman, for the, for the help. Uh, I hope the, the other one were not so were more you um, more new to, to pointers. Uh, you, you will think over all of the, of the exercise, but I think uh, over the time you, you, you will get it. All right. Uh, so this should have been done uh, at 12 o'clock. It's uh, <laughs> We, we, have, we have a half an hour left. So uh, we have two, two options. We continue and we go as far as we can. Uh, maybe we, we keep uh, a bit of time at least to have a look at one or two exercises with uh, go routines that could be interesting. Um, so maybe I will go a bit quicker over uh, arrays, slice, and maps, and uh, and have a deeper look uh, at go routines and channel. If you if you're fine with this, you can raise up your hand. If not, I will uh, continue, and you you could uh, uh, end up uh, by yourself if you want. Yes, okay. I think it's it's a key feature of the language. So seeing all the the hands raising. Um, I, I will I will go a bit more quick here. I, I won't do all the exercise for the arrays and map and so on, and we will go uh, to to the next step. All right. So in Go we have arrays. Um, arrays have fixed fixed size. So once you declare an array of ten in ten integers, uh, the size is part of the type and you won't be able to modify, add, or remove values of a, an, uh, an array of integers. If you want, um, if, if you want, um, if you want to be able to resize, to resize an array, um, you don't have to use an array. Uh, it's called a slice. I think you have the same in, in Python, uh, the slices. So, what is exactly a, a slice? A slice is more, you can think of a slice uh, as a, a pointer to an array. So it's a pointer to the first element of an array. And um, a slice has a length and a capacity. So we will see how, um, how to, to build a, a slice. So as I told you, the, the slice, the, the element of the slice is a pointer to the first element of a table. So the, the zero value of a slice is nil, like a pointer, as it's the pointer to the first uh, element of a fixed size array. That was a good way to introduce pointer. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, here is the, the underlying way of Go to implement uh, the slices. So when you use them, you have to think of that. 
for example, so how, how do you build a slice? Um, to be able to build a slice, you use a special keyword we didn't use so far, which is make. So here you ask Go uh, to make an integer of uh, a, a slice of integers uh, that has a length of five. So the result of this would be a slice of five elements. Uh, and as it's an integer, all the, the values would be zero. Um, you can use a special notation for slices. Um, you, you can resize them, uh, so make bigger or smaller slices from one slice. And what is interesting, uh, you can use two elements separated by a, um, by a colon to extract a, 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 sub, a sub slice of a slice. So if you have a slice of uh, 10 elements and you want to, to take elements from two to six, you can use such a notation uh, my slice, lower bound, higher bound. Just take care that the, the higher bound is, ex is, is exclusive. Uh, so it's a uh, high minus one element that you will get in your sub, uh, in your sub slice. So here is an example. Uh, we make uh, a, a, a byte slice of five. Here the length and the capacity would be five. And you say, um, I want to extract uh, from this first slice A a new slice B, uh, and I want to take from element two to four. So here is index zero, one, two. So we'll take element two to four for exclusive. So we will only take element two and three. And uh, so how does Go do that? Um, go will just move the pointer to the first element to the first you want, which is the the element at uh, the element at index two, and uh, it will modify the length. The length is not five anymore; it's only two because you only ask for two elements, but. The, the initial capacity was five, so you still uh, have one memory address that is um, allocated for you to be able to increase your um, your size. So the capacity moves to three because you have moved the pointer to the first element to the third one, but the rest of the capacity of the slice is still the same. So it's also a bit tricky, you have to, it's good to have some pictures to visualize how it's implemented, but that's how um, it, it works in Go. And if you modify here the initial uh, slice, and for example, you put uh, a four and a four in, in elements uh, two and three, it will also change uh, the slice B as both slice point on the same memory uh, memory uh, space. So this is something you have to, to take care of. Uh, it's not a copy. If you want to copy a slice, you have to do a loop and copy it. But uh, if you just extract sub slices like this, take care uh, because uh, you will modify all the, all the, same, uh, the same elements because it's, uh, they are both pointing to, to the same uh, memory address. So when you create a slice, the underlying array is created as well. Yes, yes. When you create a slice, Go is allocating for you. Uh, if you if you ask for um, for a, 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 a new slice, Go allocates the memory, and we will see in the next slice. Um, so here are some. Um, you can also specify with the make the capacity. It's the third parameter when you create a slice that you can create. And um, when you do an append, that's what I wanted to, to, to tell you. Uh, when you use append, append, you can add um, as much elements as you want to an existing slice. And the result, is a new slice. 
but take care. Um, as long as the, the capacity of the slice is sufficient to be able to add the, the elements, um, the, the address return here may be the same. The, it's, it may point to the same sli slice. But if you have a slice of capacity 5 and you want to add, uh, uh, an, 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 uh, add an element, then Go will allocate a new slice of size uh, of 10. I think it's, it's, uh, the, it doubles the size of the underlying array. And here you will get the address of a new slice. Then when you use append, and we will just have a look here. When you lose, when you um, when you use the the append, the way to to use append is to do uh, a uh, equals. Uh, sorry, excuse, excuse me. When you use append, you have to say a equals append the a uh, of a and three, for example. You can say four, five, six, uh, whatever. Um, if for any reason a is not big enough uh, to to add the three elements, happen we allocate a new memory space, and the um, here a would point to a new a new memory address, and uh, so maybe it could work or, or not depending on the size. So the, the good practice is when you append, you reassign the new uh, slice with the appended element to the origin, original slice. And this is because of the memory allocation in Go. So always do that, the A here and A here. Append is not able just to, to if, if you, if you think, okay, it's fine. I uh, I added all my elements. I uh, I used the append. This is not working because um, the 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 new modified slice is returned by append for all this memory this uh, memory allocation. I went a bit quick on that part, but uh, at least you have all the all the theory. Uh, so slices are fine. They are very useful but take care of the memory management. There are some, uh, some, some you, you could be trapped uh, by, by some usage of the, of the slices when you first start. At least when I started with Go, um, I had an, an error every time I, I was using slice because I, I, I forgot that the, the, the higher bound was exclusive. So at least take care of that. Okay, um, you can iterate over uh, a slice or an array uh, with a for loop. And in the for loop, you have a, a special syntax. Uh, you use the, mo the keyword range. So you ask for to range over your array or your slice or your map. And the first element is the index in, in, the, in the array. And the second is a copy of the value. I really mentioned here, it's a copy. If you try to modify V in a loop, it won't change uh, the initial slice or array. Just take, really take care of that. If you want to change the elements of a slice inside the loop, you have to go back to the slice uh, between square brackets and use the index. Here you will be able to modify uh, to modify the element. But if you just use v here, you you won't be able to change it. This is also um, some uh, some beginner's uh, trap. Um, you can omit using underscore uh, the index if you just want to iterate over the values. Uh, if you don't use, use it, you would get an error. So you can mute the, the index. 
and you can also mute the value. Uh, if you do, do this, just remove it. It's not mandatory. You can loop only over the, the indexes. So we will skip that exercise. Uh, you have to, to write um, a function that gives the index of a word in a slice of string. It's not very difficult. You can do this as, a, as homework. Um, in Go, we have also maps. So it's like dictionaries. You have a key and a value. So it's a special keyword map. Maps are also strongly typed. So you have to declare the type of the key and the type of the value. To build the map, you also use the keyword make. So you say, OK, I want to create a new map, which key type is a string, and the value is a vector. You could also use vector uh, pointers he here if you want. It's not, uh, it's not something that uh, you cannot do. And here's how you can uh, literally instantiate a map, initialize a map. Uh, you say, OK, I'm building a map of strings and vectors. And you could give the GPS points, G GPS position of Bell Labs and Google and within a vector. So this is how it works. Or you could also use um, some special keyword for maps. So to, to assign a value in a map, you just use the name of the map the name of the key, and you assign the, elem the element. If you want to delete a value, you have a special keyword delete. You just say, I want to delete in the map m the value of that key. This works. And maybe you have the question, OK, how do I get an element uh, of a map? As usual in other language, you, you use the name of the map, and you use square brackets and the key, this will return the element. If for any reason the key is not existing in the map, uh, then the, ele the element won't be nil. It won't be the zero value of the type of the value. So if you have a map of integers, if the key, uh, the key is not present, you will get a zero here. To be able to know if a key exists or not in Go, um, you can use the double parameter assignment. So if you if you do the same uh, as before, but with a second parameter, uh, OK, which is a Boolean here, if the key exists, OK will be true. If not, it will be false. So this is the way you check. Uh, if a key is contained in, a, in contained in the map, uh, you can. If you just want to know that, you can eventually mute this using the underscore. So nothing new on um, on map here. Uh, on maps, they are used as most of the languages. Just you don't have uh, methods to add or remove um, to add or remove elements. Uh, just to say, this morning we, we used the primary types, uh, integers, floats, and so on for our uh, functions. You can also use, as it was, uh, maybe you saw it before by the, by the, the, the guy who was uh, doing his demo at uh, one o'clock. You can use function as parameters and val return values of other functions. So we say that uh, functions are first class citizen in Go because you can assign functions to variables. You can pass functions to other functions and so on. So Go is almost an object-oriented uh, language, uh, a, fun a pr functional program programming language, uh, thanks to that. Uh, time flies. Um, so Go has no classes. We see the structures. To be able to add methods on, um, on, uh, on structures in Go, you don't put the parameters like we did before, this morning for functions. You put it between the, mo the, the keyword func and the declaration of the variable. If you do this, this means you are adding a special method called apps 
on uh, the type vertex. And this is quite interesting. So you can uh, you can add like like this uh, methods on your on your structures. So this is a function call. This, this is what we did this morning. And uh, sorry, this is a function call, and this is a, a, a method. And the difference between the two is where you put the parameter. Here it's a method, the vertex is before the name, the name of the function. And here it's in parameter of the function. You can add, uh, you can add uh, a method on uh, a type, not only on structure. This can be eventually useful, but you can do you you can only add a method on on types when you are in the same package. So you cannot improve uh, float sixty four for example, which is a primitive type, because you are not in the same package for doing this. And uh, what what we what we what is this parameter called is the, the receiver. So we can use a, a value receiver, but we can also use here pointers. And when we put here a pointer, the advantage of putting here a pointer is to be able to modify the value you are passing uh, in the method. So you, are, you if you put a pointer, you can, for example, scale a vector uh, because as it's, it's a pointer, you have access to its internal uh, attributes and you can modify them. If you don't put a pointer here, that's, a, that's what I was e explaining before. If you don't put a pointer here, what you will get is a copy of the current in instance. And if you modify it, it won't change. Uh, it won't change. So, so that's, what, that's why it's better usually to use uh, pointers Every time uh, when you define uh, when you define uh, methods, even if you don't need to, it's better to put everywhere pointers uh, for for methods. And um, I, I will completely skip this this chapter. It's about interfaces. Uh, there are also something uh, you have to know a bit for interfaces and pointers, but I really want at least to do one exercise on channels and, uh, and go routines. So I will skip all that part. Uh, you can define uh, interfaces in Go. It's quite useful as you don't have inheritance. Uh, and the way then you can do it is using interfaces and it's quite interesting. And we, when you define uh, interfaces, also you you can choose to put interfaces and methods on the pointer value or not. And it's also better to put it every time on pointers, so you are sure your interfaces are implemented. Uh, so I will just go ahead. Concurrency. So this is the the, the last part. Um, so Go has Go routines. Uh, Go routines is not thread management. It's an abstraction on top of threads. So when you, your Go program is starting, um, the Go runtime in your program is initializing uh, a pool of thread. I mean, really, uh, OS threads. And then when you use the Go routines, it's the runtime of Go, which has an internal scheduler that will um, choose on which OS thread your Go routine has to be run. And this is the work of the, the, the Go scheduler. So if you want uh, to have a, a main execution line uh, and you want to execute something else in parallel, uh, Maybe you have your um, your web server that is listening to connections and handling web connections, and you want uh, when you receive um, a request from a client, when you want to compute something but you don't want it to be blocking the other clients, you will be able to to give that work to another Go routine, 
And then the go runtime will allow CPU to the main go routine that is handling your web server and to that new go routine that is doing some computation in background. And to be able to, to create a second execution unit, you use the keyword go. So if you run your function f, then it's run um, in your main go routine of your main function of your program. And if you use the go and then your function call, um, then this will be executed in parallel. And you can launch as much as you want of go uh, routines. There, are, there, there can be issues of uh, go routines leak. So take care not to do uh, something that you, you don't manage. When a go routine starts, you have to know when also it will end to be sure you, you won't have uh, go routine leaks over time. Um, this is go routine. So if, if we have a look at exercise 27, uh, here we have a loop and uh, we use in the, in the main function directly stop interrupting me. So we do this five times and we sleep one millisecond every time. And uh, just before we say, okay, run the same function in another go routine. So if we have a look at what this looks like, 27 and we run it and we can execute it several times. So what happens here? Uh, both go routines are executing in parallel. It's the go scheduler that will allow one function or another to be executed. So if you execute this uh, another time, you won't have the same results. Here we have want me, want me, me. Here we have want me, me. It's really the, the go scheduler that will, uh, that will choose which one is executed. But we see that both are executed in parallel. If we remove uh, the, the go keyword here and we run it again, we will, we will have five, five times the first one and five times the second one. So what we can see here uh, is that we have uh, this parallel execution of both, um, of both functions. Okay for you? And once you, you launch a Go routine, um, it's not in your main Go routine anymore. So how do you do to communicate with a Go routine that has been uh, run in parallel of your main Go routine? So to be able to do that, um, Go has what is called channels. So it's a kind of pipe uh, that is, uh, that you can connect to several Go routines, and then they will be able to exchange data uh, between the between them, thanks to this channel. So, how do you create uh, and uh, use a channel? Um, to you do some ASCII art in your code. So, if ch here is the channel, and you want to send the value v on the channel. You just uh, you you just type uh, an arrow uh, stating that you are sending in the channel through the pipe the value v, and if you want to read from a channel, you say okay, here I have a channel. When going out of the channel, which is the the sense of this uh, this arrow here, I want to assign the value that comes through uh, the pipe directly to my variable v here. The data flows or follows always the, the arrow. So how, how do we make a channel? Uh, how do we create, instantiate a, a channel? It's the same for, as for, um, as, as for um, slices and so on. We use the special keyword make, and we say uh, to the make uh, function, please create a channel of type integer. The channels are also typed. You can do channels of structures. 
you can do channels of vectors, for example, channels of whatever. Uh, this is uh, this is fine. And another thing, um, a channel can if if you just declare a channel like this, your channel will able to contain only one element. This is good, but uh, maybe you have uh, hundreds of producers and uh, just a few go routine that are able to um, to process the data. So what you what is interesting is to to have a buffer. So inside your Go program, you can create buffers, which are the channels, and uh, for for to create uh, buffer channels, you just add a size to the make function. So here we are creating a new channel of integers, and this channel uh, can uh, contain hundreds elements before it is blocking. So once a channel is full, a buffer channel is full, or even a channel with only one element is full. Uh, uh, we come back. Uh, once you, your channel is full, you cannot put any data inside your channel before someone else has read has read an element from it. So once an, uh, uh, a channel is full, you cannot write any more inside it. In the exercise 27, we have undetermined square of uh, the routine. Yes, sometimes five or sometimes six. Um, we should have maximum of five uh, of five um, printf of each, but the order is uh, totally uh, is totally uh, undetermined. Uh, sorry, I think we have in total six, as you can see. In stop interrupt. I mean, in the above, without the go uh, calling routine, we have six. Yes. Ah, uh, yes, because uh, no, because what? when it's coroutine, it becomes sometimes five, sometimes six. And I think this is what you meant by leaking or. No, it should not, because we, we have a loop. Uh, from uh, five, from zero, zero, to five. Ah, zero to six. Yes. No, I think uh, when the, the main go routine, the, the, the main function as a as a the, the primary go routine of all go routines, and when the main functions exits, all uh, child go routine are stopped. So we should have uh, six. But once the main go routine has finished, then uh, the, the 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 child go routine one, which is the I talk whenever I want, is uh, is stopped. That's why sometimes you you should always have six stop inter interrupting me, but you may have um, less than six. I talk whenever whenever I want because when the main function has stopped, the the, the go program stops, even if the child go routine has not finished. Okay, so the the, the go routines then in this example would be at most six. The other one is exactly six because it's the main core routine. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so buffer channel. You can also close a channel. Uh, usually when you have an, an application that is building something with channels, you create a pool of go routine to, to do some asynchronous uh, process uh, of data or so on. So you, you you don't you always leave your channels and your pool of go routines running. You don't want to stop and start. Maybe it can can occur, but it's not a, a, a main way of handling it. But if you want, you can close a channel. But take take just care of one thing. Only uh, the producer of data, so only the one who is uh, sending uh, data to a channel, can close it. If the consumer closes a channel and someone else tries to write in the channel that is already closed, uh, it will uh, panic in your in your Go program. So just take care of that. Uh, that's just here. You can use a for loop on a channel to iterate over all the elements, and the for loop will uh, continue to loop 
as long as the channel is open. So this is also a way to consume uh, from, a, from a channel. And um, yes, this is what, something I wanted to, to show you. Uh, this is one of my last slides. Um, you have something that looks like a switch, but it's not a switch. Uh, if, you, if you have a, a deeper look, it's a select keyword. If you have a go routine um, that has to, to listen to several channels, you can uh, use uh, the select statement to be able to, to, to listen to several channels. So you can do some uh, multiplexing of the channels. So for example, you have, um, you have a, a first channel when you, where you send data uh, you can do this, and you, if you if you want to do to do graceful shutdown on your computer, uh, there are special uh, channels uh, for the signals uh, in in the standard library of Go. So when someone hits uh, Control C, you can be notified of the interruption signal through a channel, and then do the last processing and do a graceful shutdown. If you have a web server, you can then handle your properly your last uh, request and then don't take any new request anymore and so on. And this is something you can uh, achieve using a, a select case uh, statement. And you also have a, a default statement in a select case. And that default statement uh, is then called when no other case is true. And this is one of my favorite uh, exercise here. Um, so how, how does it work? In the time package of the standard library of Go, uh, we have a ticker, which is a clock. And that function returns a channel of time. So every 250 milliseconds, you will have a timestamp a type stamp, uh, coming out of that tick channel, OK? And um, you can also uh, build a channel, which is a timeout. So after two seconds, you will receive one timestamp uh, th that is notifying you that the two seconds uh, have have run and that it's it's timeout. So we we have a main go routine and we put um, um, a loop, uh, an infinite loop with a for with no condition here, and inside that for loop. Uh, we use the select case. So every 250 milliseconds, we will get the ticker, the clock, tick, 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 tick. And after two seconds are, 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 um, are, have passed, we will get the timeout on the boom and we will finish, uh, we will return from the infinite loop. And between the 250 milliseconds, the default target will be hit, and we just will print one character and sleep for 50 milliseconds. So if, uh, if we run that, it's quite nice. Tick, 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 boom. And between the tick, we have uh, the default every 50 milliseconds, and we have one, two, three, four, five. Five times five, uh, five times 50 is the 250 milliseconds. And after two seconds, uh, our bomb uh, is exploding. So it's a, a nice way of, uh, of illustrating how a go routine can listen to several, uh, several um, channels. And as an exercise, uh, you, you, could, you can have a look. You also have um, the correction of the exercise. Here we are 
doing some requests, uh, some curls to google.com uh, and query for Golang. And how could we do, uh, instead of doing this in one uh, for loop and waiting for each, uh, each call, uh, how, how can we use two channels, one for the result, one for the errors? And uh, and speed up speed up the the curves and doing all the curves in parallel instead of doing them one after another. So I I, I, I let you this as a as a homework. Uh, so we are at the end of this course. Sorry, I had really to to skip all the interface part, which is a big part. Um, usually I, I do that uh, on a whole uh, whole day. Uh, I try really to to remove and to speed up uh, removing all the exercise, but it still takes a, a bit of time to to explain all the details of um, all the details of the uh, of, of the Go language. I hope at least you had a good first experience and that you will continue to to dig a bit further. Uh, really, you can. Use the slides and the exercise on the on the GitHub to to continue on your own, and you can also have a look at the the Go Tour. Uh, all the slides and all we did comes from the the Go Tour, and uh, you can do this uh, online. You have the exercise, you have everything, so you will be a and you have all the languages. You can do this in English, in French, and whatever. Uh, so have fun. I was really pleased to to be here and uh, I will stay connected a few minutes if you have some more questions I will be glad to to answer them <laughs>